go ahead and invite you to take a copy of the Bible. Open with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. Again, if you do not have a Bible, you will find one in one of the seats around you. I invite you to follow along with us. Mark chapter 15. Now, when we look back at our lives and when we think about where we are now, where we have been, um, it is often we can go back and we, we can look at the moments that have shaped us as people. There are turning points, there are milestones, there are other extremely important events that shape us into who we are, both for better and for worse. And it's the same thing on a larger scale. When we think about global history, when we think about world history, we think about the events, like I said, on a global scale or even on a local scale, that have a large impact on history and our ways of life. And there are no more important events in the Christian faith, and I would argue in the history of the world, than the death and the resurrection of Jesus, which we will look at this week and next week as we finish our study of the Gospel of Mark. This event is, that, is the thing that the Gospel of Mark has been building toward and moving to all along. Ever since we started this series back in January, Mark has been moving us to these moments. All of the things that we've seen Jesus do, all of the people that we have seen Jesus interact with, all of the miracles that he has performed have been pointing us toward the hope that we have in his death and in his resurrection. That he is the son of God who came to take away our sin. And without the death and the resurrection of Jesus, then we have no hope. But with his resurrection, we have been given all hope in God through Christ. Now, I had originally planned to go all the way through verse 47 through the end of uh, chapter 15. And studying this week and going through it, I decided to shorten it. So we'll actually just go through verses 21 through 39. But if you have your place in Mark 15, I invite you to stand with me as we read our passage beginning in verse 21. Mark 15, verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in, the way, that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, just for your son Jesus. And we thank you for his death that he died. We thank you for the life that he lived. And we thank you for the resurrection that he has and that he's with you today. And Father, we pray, even as we've thought about, as we've worked our way through this gospel, that this is at once a tragic passage, but it is at once also a glorious passage, Lord. Father, will we see our redemption accomplished by your son Jesus on the cross? We pray this morning that you would lead us, God, into further understanding, lead us into deeper relationship with you, show us how this applies to our lives here in 2023. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So our main idea of the sermon today is that Christ died on the cross so that we may live. Christ died on the cross so that we may live. 
So again, as we often see, there's three things I think that stand out to us as we read this passage and as we look at it. The first thing I think we see is Jesus' visible suffering. Jesus is visible suffering. There is suffering that Jesus is undergoing that everyone is seeing. It's, a, it's apparent to everyone that Jesus is suffering. Look with me here at verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. So this is after Jesus has been scourged, after he has been beaten, and he is now, they are making his way, he is making his way to the place where he's going to be crucified. And as it was with victims of crucifixion, they would have to carry their cross. Now, in all likelihood, this is not the cross itself, all of it. It would have been the cross beam, the beam that he would have been nailed or tied to. And they are making his way, he's making his way to a public place, a place which Mark calls and is known as Golgotha, meaning place of the skull. It would have been a very public place, typically by a road where people would have walked by and seen people who were being crucified. It was meant to be a deterrent. If you don't want to be crucified, don't do what this person did. Now, Mark mentions specifically a few men here. One, Simon of Cyrene, who we understand being from present-day Ethiopia. And Jesus likely has fallen. He has lost strength after being awake all night and after being beaten. And so they grab Simon of Cyrene and they and compel him to carry the cross. As I said, it would have been the cross beam. And likely what it been is the cross itself wouldn't look like the cross that we imagine. wouldn't have looked like this. The cross actually would have looked more like a T. And after Jesus would have been nailed to it, he would have been raised to the top and put on top. The cross beam would have been put on top of a permanent pole. And it would have, been look, it would have looked like what we would picture as a T rather than the cross that you see behind me. As I said, Paul also mentions Rufus and he mentions Alexander because they, these guys were sons of Simon of Cyrene. Now, when we read the book of Romans, Paul refers to a guy named Rufus. So it is likely and it may be possible that this is the same Rufus that Mark is talking about. And so what Mark is pointing out is, hey, you know these guys. This is someone that you know, or at least it's connected to someone you know. For us, it's important for us to see these were real people. This is a moment in time that is taking place that there were actual witnesses to. This is not something that someone just made up. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. These are historical people here. Look with me at verse 23. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Now, uh, there were usually groups of ladies who would offer um, what the, uh, kind of a concoction here that would have had some type of medicine in it or some type of drug that was intended to numb or have and take off some of the edge of the pain for the person who is being crucified. But Jesus refuses it. Jesus is going to feel the full impact of the pain of crucifixion. Remember, Jesus has to endure a punishment. It's not just that Jesus is dying. It's that Jesus is dying a punitive death. And he is taking on and feeling the full brunt of this penalty. Verse 24. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. He's talking about the soldiers there. And it was the third hour, which we understand to be 9 a.m., 9 in the morning, when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. So Mark does not give us the details of crucifixion. His readers likely would have known, it could have pictured in their mind, what was taking place when one was crucified. They likely witnessed it. And also Mark's focus is not so much on the physical suffering that Jesus is enduring, but it's going to be, as we've seen, the emotional shame and mockery that Jesus is undergoing. Now, victims uh, normally would have been nailed or tied to a cross in a public place, as we've said, and death and crucifixion normally came by asphyxiation or suffocation or even just extreme exhaustion and could take up to days to happen. Because eventually they would become so tired and exhausted they could not push up to allow their lungs to inflate. So it's a horrible way to die. And then Mark also gives us the details of some of these things that are happening. One of those being the soldiers casting lots for Jesus' clothes, which, was, which fulfilled Scripture, which Glenn read for us from Psalm 22. 
Now, I won't be able to point out all the places where we see Scripture fulfilled here from the Old Testament, but I encourage you to go back and look at the footnotes in your Bible where you see where Mark points out places in Psalm and Isaiah and other places in the Old Testament where the prophecies were fulfilled in this moment as Jesus is hanging on the cross. We see one of those again, Isaiah, fulfilled in verse 27. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus is here on public display. The reason that they were casting lot for his clothes is because they crucified him with no clothes. He's laid bare for anyone to see who happened to walk by. And it's going to be apparent to anyone that a person being crucified is suffering physically, emotionally. Being without covering brings a sense of shame, which is what they wanted when they crucified someone. Being exposed with nowhere to hide. And as we've already seen with Jesus leading up to the crucifixion, he continues to be mocked in verse 29. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Again, the fulfillment of Psalm 22 takes place here as there are different groups who come by and mock Jesus. But each insult that's lobbed to him is just dripping with irony when we read this. When they, these pass by, these pastors by have some knowledge of what Jesus was accused of, of his trial in the Sanhedrin, making fun of him for supposedly predicting the destruction and the rebuilding of the temple, challenging him to come down from the cross. But here's the irony. Jesus may not have been physically destroying the temple, but he was taking away the need for a temple as he's, ha- as he's hanging here on the cross. Jesus would have no need, or God would have no need for a brick and mortar building to be with his people. Because once Jesus accomplished the atonement here on the cross, God's glory would be unleashed to live among his people, to live among all of those who are in Christ. This death is paving a way for God to dwell in his people. But there's going to be other groups who mock him as well. Verse 31. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So the chief priests are next, along with those who are hanging on crosses beside him. And these chief priests are so smug in what they say. These scribes, they they want to make sure that Jesus knows, hey, we defeated you. You came against us, but look who's won this battle. Now again, there's more irony in their taunts. They acknowledge that Jesus healed and saved others. They acknowledge that there was something supernatural about Jesus, some type of supernatural power that he has shown, and that Jesus has demonstrated signs that prove that he is who he said he was. But yet they want another sign. Jesus, prove to us that you are the king of the Jews by coming down from the cross. And if you do that, we will see that and we will believe. Never mind that you've healed all these people. Never mind that you've brought people back from the dead. We, we just need to see you come down from the cross. What do you think Jesus has been doing this entire time throughout all of Galilee and here in Jerusalem? The priests, their heart was so hard that nothing would have satisfied them as a sign. Instead, they accused him of blasphemy and accused him of being from Satan and ultimately murdered him, the one whom they proclaimed to be waiting for from God. And then again, an ironic twist, they wanted Jesus to come down from the cross to prove that he was God. But as many have said, one being Leon Morris, he proved he was God, and we believe he is God because he stayed on the cross, not because he came down. And part of Jesus' visible outward suffering, and the part that Mark is focusing us on, that we've seen here in what we've just read, is the continued mockery and shame that Jesus underwent as he hung on the cross. Jesus has been humiliated laid on the cross in a shameful and vile way to die, without clothes, exposed to all who might see him as they pass by. There was no place for Jesus to hide. There was no place for Jesus to withdraw and take shelter. Nothing. 
Nakedness, as we know, go all, when we go all the way back to the garden, has come to symbolize shame and humiliation. When Adam and Eve sinned, their security with God was compromised, and they hid because their sin had exposed them. But Jesus is experiencing and taking on this shame for you and for me. It's the ultimate demonstration of love, as Paul says in Romans 5, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's willing to take on this humiliation, this suffering, this shame and mockery, both for his glory and for our redemption. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews writes it in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what did Jesus do with the shame he experienced on the cross? It says he despised it, the writer of Hebrews says. Now, one meaning for despise means extreme hatred. That's the one the definition that probably comes to our mind most often. But to despise something also means to think nothing of it. So Jesus, as he's hanging on the cross and doing this shame, it says he thinks nothing of it. He didn't enjoy it. But he also didn't run from it. He did it thinking of the joy that was set before him. Joy that he would have when he was reunited with his father. Joy that he would have in his glory and his reward. Joy at our redemption that he was paying for. And we need to see that Jesus bore our shame and takes our shame when we come to him in faith for salvation. Now shame can be a good thing. Shame is what lets us know that we need to repent after we have sinned. A conscience that is sensitive to sin, friends, is a good thing. It's a gift. Because it lets us know that we need to repent of our sin or repent of what we have done wrong. Shame is what we rightly feel when we realize how our sin offends God. We feel exposed before him when we realize how bad our sin is. But praise God for Christ who covers and takes our shame. Now, we are not to stay in shame once we have repented. We might have regret over our sin, but friends, regret and shame are two different things. But there's also a shame that we feel, not because of something that we do, But sometimes there's shame that we feel when something happens to us or someone does something to us and we feel ashamed of what's happened. You may feel shame because someone has abused you in some way, physically, verbally, or some other way. And there is a shameful scar that you carry with you and maybe you've never even talked about it. Or maybe you're ashamed of something that has happened in your family or something that has happened in your life. Maybe the way someone treated you. And any time those things come to mind, you feel shameful. And if that's you this morning, first of all, take comfort knowing that Christ knows what that feels like. Christ knows what it feels like to be humiliated and to experience shame because of something someone has done to him, as we're seeing here on the cross. And the good news is, is that Christ has dealt with both of these types of shame. And he takes away both of these types of shame. When we come to Christ, when we come to Christ, he takes our shame and gives us his righteousness. When we are in Christ, we're not defined by our sin, and we are not defined by what has happened to us in our past. If we are in Christ, we are defined by his grace and the righteousness he has given us. No matter how we might feel when we think of what we have done or what has happened to us, nothing changes the fact that if we are in Christ, that we are pure and we are righteous in God's eyes. We are defined by a person in Christ, not our circumstances and not our past. The temptation we face is to believe the lie that we have sinned so greatly that it cannot be overcome and that it cannot be forgiven. Or that there is a shame or a hurt over something that has happened to us that will never go away. 
So when we are tempted to believe those false things, we need to remember what is true and proclaim to ourselves the truth that we see in God's word. Remember that we are made pure by Jesus through his shed blood. We remind ourselves that we are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And we must be a people who preach the gospel to ourselves daily to remind us that we are whole in Christ and nothing separates us from him. And that might mean taking steps to talk with someone to begin that journey, to deal with the shame that you carry. But the key to dealing with our sin and our shame is right here in Hebrews 12, friends. Look to Christ. So friends, if you're carrying shame, look to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who was mocked and shamed and suffered visibly for us. So Jesus, we see Jesus' visible suffering. Next, we see Jesus' invisible suffering. There is suffering that's going on that is invisible that Jesus is enduring. Look at verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we understand this to be about 12 noon. And about 12 o'clock noon, when the sun should have been shining, darkness spreads all over the land here. And we can look in history and we see there's, there, there is recording of this happening. And all throughout history, there have been explanations as to why what might have been actually happening. That maybe there was some type of solar eclipse that's happening. When you read the historical accounts, it's actually what they attribute it to. But Passover happens, which is when this is happening. Passover always took place at a full moon. And while there is a full moon, it is impossible for there to be a lunar eclipse. There is something supernatural taking place here. There is a supernatural darkness that, that is spreading over the land here as Jesus is hanging on the cross dying. And it lasted for three hours. If you remember our last full solar eclipse that took place back in 2017, it was only a few minutes. Solar eclipses don't last that long. And it symbolizes that, Jesus, or that God's judgment is taking place. The presence of darkness accompanies the display of God's wrath in the Old Testament. One of those places being Amos 8. Remember what we read in Mark 14 when Jesus was talking about the end times. He talked about the sun and the moon going out, giving out no light. Now you see that there are things that are going on here that are, your, that are very visible. So you go, well, what do you mean Jesus is suffering invisibly? What's happening here seems to be very visible. Jesus' utterance here in verse 34 lets us know that he is suffering in a way that I believe it's impossible for us to fully understand and fully see. And in verse 34, it's one of the utterances that we see recorded in the Gospels. And we hear that he is suffering the abandonment by his Father. He is suffering the abandonment and wrath from the one that he has had unhindered fellowship with. And even the bystanders here misunderstand what's happening when he cried out. Look at verse 35. It says, And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us, whether, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Again, another fulfillment of Psalm 69, where Jesus has offered here sour wine. Now, what this would have been would have been a soured wine. Some, some of your translations may say vinegar, and it would have been mixed with water. It's what the soldiers would have had with them to drink when they got thirsty. But what we're seeing here is continued mockery from those who are there. It's traditional belief that Elijah would come to those who are suffering, particularly those if you were righteous and suffering, that Elijah would come to help you. And they're saying, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But they don't understand that Jesus is suffering something that is invisible. Yes, there's visible effects of his abandonment, but the type of suffering he's dealing with, the, the weight of the wrath and the abandonment that's sitting on his shoulders at this moment is invisible. You can't see it. And Jesus' abandonment, this is what he was anticipating in the Garden of Gethsemane. The moment when all of the wrath of God, God the Father, would be poured out on him. And that's why he cries out saying, God, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you? Why have you left me here? Now, Jesus knows what's happening. 
He understands that this has to take place. His control of the situation has never been in doubt. But there is this feeling of abandonment as he looks to his father for comfort. And he doesn't find comfort, but instead finds wrath and finds anger. Scripture's full of how angry God is at sin. And as God is bearing the sin of the world, Jesus is bearing the sin of the world, he is sensing God's wrath and anger at that sin that is then laid on him. And that's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So this invisible suffering is due to the sin of the world that is laid on Christ and abandonment from his father. In this moment, we have something that is also completely unique to the Christian faith. Remember, we understand that God exists in the Trinity. There is one God and God is one in three persons. Each person in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is fully God. So don't miss what's happening here. God is at once pouring out his wrath. God the Father is unleashing the full torrent of his anger and wrath while the sin is resting on Jesus. While God the Son, Jesus, is bearing and experiencing his wrath. So God is at once pouring out his wrath and at the same time experiencing and feeling his wrath. Friends, I don't know how to illustrate that. And there is no other religion, there is no other faith in which the payment for sin is both required and paid for by God. It's one of the reasons it's a stumbling block to others. How could God bear wrath? Why would God bear wrath? And that's the question that Jesus is asking. Why did you forsake me? And the quick answer is because of your sin and my sin. Our sin had to be punished. Someone had to bear the full weight of God's wrath as a punishment for sin. And Jesus is taking the punishment that you and I deserve right here on the cross. So why did God forsake Jesus? So that sin would be dealt with once and for all. Now, we understand Jesus is being punished. And he's being punished on our behalf. He was abandoned for us. He suffered emotional and spiritual weight of the wrath of God. But why did he have to be punished? Why did there have to be a penalty? And Mark gives us the answer next as we see what happens when Jesus dies. Next, we see the visible completion of Jesus' work. The visible completion of Jesus' work. Look at verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus, at this moment, he utters a loud cry. Other gospels say, you know, this is when he says, it is finished. Into your hand I commit my spirit. Friends, Jesus dies when he intended to die. He didn't necessarily die of exhaustion. He didn't die of of crucifixion. He died when he meant to. In the fullness of time, Jesus was born, and in the fullness of time, Jesus died. The moment when Jesus would die was set well before he ever got to the cross. And what we see happening here, when Jesus died, Mark tells us in verse 38, that the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And we understand he's referring to the curtain that separated the sanctuary from the holy of holies. The area of the temple where only the high priest was supposed to go or was allowed to go and was allowed to go one time per year. Now, this curtain was actually more of a wall. Okay? It would have been about four inches thick, was 60 feet high, or 60 feet long, 30 feet high. It's no ordinary curtain. And as I said, the priest would go in once a year to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people and himself. And this curtain represented the separation of God and his people. Because inside the Holy of Holies, atonement had to be made for the sins of the people. Because God is so holy, he could not be in contact with sinful people, with anything sinful. In order for there to be reconciliation, in order for there to be atonement, a penalty had to be paid to appease the wrath of God. And this is the place where the atonement was made for the sins of the people. Now, don't miss what Mark is telling us. 
that Jesus was making the final atonement for our sin. That was why he had to come to earth, to be a perf- to live a perfect life and die as a substitute to take our punishment. There had to be a punishment, there had to be a penalty to appease the wrath of God and to make right our sin before him in his holiness. And the moment that Jesus died, then that payment was made and we were given access to the Father. The curtain was torn, don't miss it, from top to bottom. From the top where God is to the bottom where we are. Not from men to God. Not from bottom up. There is no mistaking that God is the one who instituted and accomplished the work and the plan of redemption that saves us. Christ's atonement on the cross was accepted by God and it pleased God. So there was no need for a holy of holies anymore. The way was made for us to come and experience life through faith. We no longer have to sacrifice animals as Jesus was our sacrifice. It says it this way in Hebrews 10. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. The writer is saying, the Holy of Holies is open to everyone. The presence of God is open to everyone. Reconciliation with God is open through Jesus. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We who were dead in our sins have been given the means of living in the presence of God. The glory in the presence of God would no longer be confined to this little space. God would now dwell within his people. And we are able to experience God with us wherever we are if we are in Christ. Jesus was forsaken so that you and I would not be. Jesus suffered an invisible spiritual abandonment so that we could be brought into the presence of God. He suffered a physical, visible suffering to achieve our salvation and make it possible. And he would later seal it as he rises from the grave in all of his glory. And to help us to continue to see this even more, Mark gives us the testimony of this centurion we see in verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, in this statement, we have from this centurion, we have the first human in the gospel of Mark to confess that Jesus was the son of God. The only being that's done that so far was a demon. But it wasn't a miracle that led this man to understand who Jesus is. He didn't see him heal a cripple or bring someone back from the dead. He witnessed the way that Jesus died. It was in the way that Jesus died that led this man to conclude that this was the Son of God. He's seen many other people die. We know from history the Romans were experts at crucifixion. This wouldn't have been necessarily this centurion's first crucifixion. But yet there was something different about this man. There was something different about this this crucified person that leads him to know and understand that he is the son of God. And don't miss the significance that this is a Gentile. It wasn't a Jew that Mark tells us. It was a Gentile. Friends, Psalm 22 is not just a psalm about abandonment. When we read later in Psalm 22, we see the hope that the psalmist places in God. And we see the proclamation of the nations who would come to worship Jesus. Psalm 22, 26 and 27 says, The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. The psalmist foretold that it would not just be Jews who would worship the Lord, but families of all the nations, families of all people. Not just Jews, but all people have been given access to God. Anyone who would call on the name of Jesus and be saved. 
Anyone who would repent of sin and turn to Christ in faith for forgiveness would be saved. Friends, our God is a missional God who seeks to be and will be known among the nations. And we see a picture of this beginning here at the foot of the cross with a Gentile confessing that this is the Son of God. The fact that we are here today, along with all that we've just read, is the visible accomplishment of Jesus' work. As you and I are products of Jesus' and Jesus' desire to be known among the nations. So how should we then live? It's a simple point of application today. And I want us to ponder, what do you see when you see Jesus on the cross? When we think of Jesus hanging on the cross, suffering, what comes to our mind? Is it confusion? Is it sympathy? Is it wonder at how anyone could possibly get here? Maybe you're skeptical. You know, this was just a political revolutionary who thinks, as we've said, and as we've heard other people kind of, uh, kind of postulate that this is, he got caught up in it, really got out of hand. My hope is that you see as the centurion that this man is the son of God, given to redeem us and release us from the bondage of sin. So I pray that you see and you realize your need for forgiveness and redemption. Friends, come to Christ today. His work is enough to save you. Your work will never be enough to save you. The salvation that God gives us is a gift. In the cross, I hope you see the love and the grace that God so willingly gives us. So come to Christ in repentance. Let your sins be forgiven and be washed clean. And if we are in Christ, then we need to remember his sacrifice and give thanks. Be filled with gratitude for the grace and the mercy and the love that we have received from Jesus. We need to be grateful that all things that we have begin and end with God. God is the giver of all good gifts, the ultimate gift being his son. And when you look at the cross, remember that we can trust God with anything. Paul says in Romans that since God has given us his son, that he didn't even withhold his son, that he will give us all good things. Is there anything, friends, worth more than God's son? Of course not. So if God has given us his son, is there anything that he's going to withhold according to his will? Is there anything he won't give us if he desires for us to have it? Would he give us his son and then some withhold something that is of lesser or greater value, rather? Of course not. So the moments when we are tempted to doubt the goodness of God, look to the cross and remember what God has done for us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the love that you have shown us in your son, Jesus. We are humbled, Father. We are grieved. But, Father, we are also joyed over we have joy at the salvation we have because of the suffering that he endured. And Father, we thank you, God, that it was not just his death. His death accomplished it, Father, but his resurrection sealed it, Lord. And God, we thank you that he is with you today. Father, we pray that you would continue to impress on us an attitude, Lord, of thankfulness for what we've been saved from and the price that it took to do it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.